ancestors. We bring from the 400 years of from the African diaspora to here. So thank you for your offering, Dr. Marsha Tateranga. Thank you, Dr. Hunt, for having me. I just want to say greetings, family. Greetings, all people in the Pacific Northwest. And to our esteemed visitor, Dr. Harding, what an honor that you are with us today. And my job is to pour the libation. I want people to understand when we pour the libation, we are performing an ancestral act. It goes back many, many years back in Africa. You know, there are many traditions and ways of pouring libation. I am going to pour libation in the revolutionary tradition that says that we refuse to forget that our ancestors lived, struggled, and died on our behalf. And because of that, I pour this libation in their name. And I need your help to just utter those words, Ashe, the words of the Yoruba people, which tell me that when I speak, I'm speaking truth. Can we just say Ashe? Ashe. Ashe. Thank Ashe. you. Ashe. We, we pour this libation today to honor the fact that there were people here before we came. Mm. We want to first acknowledge the Native Americans of this soil, mm. the Duwamish people, the Muckleshoot, all of the people who lived here on this land, whose ancestors were the custodians of this land. And they looked after it very carefully until we came. I want to acknowledge them today. Ashe. 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 I also want to acknowledge that who our ancestors were when they were minding their business, living their lives, tending their fields, raising their young and caring for the old in their homes. What a beautiful thought that we were thriving in a place called the motherland of Africa, not just the motherland of black people, but the motherland of all humanity. It was there that we know was the beginning uh, discoveries of the use of fire, astronomy, agriculture, engineering, mathematics, geometry, and hydropower. And that these are the very elements that gave forth, brought forth civilizations. So grateful to our ancestors in Africa to bring forward those civilizations. I want to remember Dr. John Henrik Clark today, who, who shared with us that if the Atlantic Ocean was to dry up today, it would reveal a trail of bones that spread all the way from Africa to the Americas. And those would be the bones of our ancestors who did not make it. And I want to honor them today because, because of them, we are here. And I want to think about those who did make that voyage that horrific voyage across those waters. And they decided they would live under all circumstances. That one day there would be a future generation that would rise up and be able to have all of the freedoms available to us in this country. And we still await that day. Let us not forget uh, Nat Turner and, and people like uh, Ya Asantewa, uh, let us think of Shaka Zulu as we sure. settle our hearts for this program. Let us always remember Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. Let That's us true. think of Frederick Douglass and, and Fannie Lou Hamer. Never to forget about uh, the greats of Sojourner Truth. All of those names of people who lived, struggled, and died on our behalf. And I want us to remember in these United States that we were in a country that forbade us to read or write. Education was not allowed to us. And yet our ancestors learned to read with a candlestick under a bushel. And they learned to count, they learned their education in, in very radical ways. And they dared to love education because they knew from where we had come and that we were the first people to invent those elements of civilization. And last, I want to remember Dr. Vincent Harding 
and also uh, Rosemarie Harding. I want to remember them because they gave their lives, they sacrificed their education and they tried to teach people in small communities and large communities across this country. Our history would not be the same without them. And we are so honored to have their offspring with us today. And so as I say these words by Bernice Johnson Regan, I just ask you to invite the ancestors to be here today to the spirit of those named and unnamed who stood and struggled before us and beside us. We offer this praise. We offer this libation. Ashe. Ashe. And so it is. Thank you. Ashe. Thank you, as always, beloved Dr. Marsha Taterunga, for inspiring us. Maybe there will be a moment when you will come back and speak to us about the stolen ones. That we would be my honor. Stories, the stolen ones, and, and we were missed. We Indeed. were missed. And now we have the opportunity to hear from a person who is a friend. Who better than a friend to introduce another friend. And so we have Dr. Ms. Sonia Hunt Gray, who is a close friend and fellow worker in the freedom movement of Dr. Rachel Elizabeth Harding. She will take the moment and offer the introduction of our esteemed guest today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. We will start with the uh, esteemed uh, acknowledgement of you, Dr. Hunt. You are um, uh, incredible. And we certainly appreciate all of your hard work, your dedication, and your commitment to, um, to brilliance and to freedom and to making the lives of, of everyone you come in contact with better. And we appreciate you very much. So we have to have to say that to, to begin with. And I would just like to ask, uh, since I do have the um, freedom of being, having the mic, if you will, if we could ask whoever is the host, if you could please spotlight, um, you know, Zoom is different. And so we uh, make adjustments. So if you could spotlight Dr. Harding, just spotlight. Put the just spotlight on Dr. Harding. <laughs> so we can do the, the intro uh, justice. As you see, Dr. Harding, you can see uh, what I'm about to say in terms of her scholarship, I want to certainly talk about those things. But when you see Dr. Harding, you see be beauty, you see excellence, you just see it inside and out. You see uh, a committed uh, poet, historian, and scholar of religions of the Afro-Atlantic diaspora. She's a native of Atlanta, Georgia. We may hear a little Southern accent, we may not. Dr. Harding teaches in the Ethnic Studies Department of the University of Colorado, uh, Denver, and writes about religion, creativity, and freedom making in the experience of people of African descent in the Americas. Part of her influence, I may say, is uh, Dr. Harding, as, as our esteemed uh, speaker who spoke initially in offering the um, offering the libation and a beautiful, you did a beautiful job and the ancestors are absolutely pleased and, and, and happy and dancing. And, but, and Dr. Harding is, uh, is, is, I had the good fortune of knowing both her mother and her father and, 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 her, and her wonderful brother, her beautiful family. And so with, with Dr. Rachel, or Rachel, they gotta get, if you grab it, I used to say snatch that PhD, you gotta give people credit. So if you got the PhD, you gotta, you have to have the honor. So I give you the honor and the praise for that, all of you for, for that accomplishment. Uh, Rachel, if I may, uh, is the daughter of uh, Dr. Vincent Harding, who was uh, instrumental in the civil rights movement, working with Dr. Dr. King, uh, he wrote a book, There is a River. He wrote the one of the book, what is the main one that we taught at, at NACA? It's blue and white. <laughs> what is the name of that one, Rachel? Um, That's the main the one, on, one. The one on the movement? Yes, that was that, and that. Yeah, I'm, why, I'm, we I'm, must share, why we must share the story of the movement is the subtitle. And I'm trying, the, 
the main title will come to me in a minute. You well, keep going. Well, her fa <laughs> father and mother, she had the, she had the, um, she had the good fortune of seeing two role models in terms of her work. And it's no accident that this is the work that, that, that Rachel has decided to be a part of her life's mission. And I hope I'm not taking too much time in terms of the intro, but I uh, just wanted to, there's a river. Hope and History is the Hope name of it. Hope and History. Hope, if you it. haven't read Hope and History, you must read Hope and History. And that was a, a book that many students, young students, high school and college uh, have. Uh, when you read that book, you have an understanding of, of, of the movement. And But Dr. Harding didn't do his work in isolation. He did his work alongside uh, Rachel, Rachel's beautiful mother, Miss Rosemary uh, Finney. Harding. And again, it was a celebration in DC once and I had the opportunity to meet to meet them both and to see their commitment. And uh, when you hear Dr. Hunt talk about the beloved community, that was a part of what Dr. Harding uh, was, was promoting. And that's what Dr. Harding uh, put uh, forth in the universe many, 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 many years ago as a Mennonite, right, Rachel, in terms of that study that he, that he did. And he was one of the first PhD, African-American PhDs in, in the country. And I'm sure that he continues to be very proud. They both continue to be very proud of you. Uh, Dr. Harding is the author of two books, A Refuge in Thunder, A History of Afro-Brazilian Religion, uh, Condomble, where she knows um, uh, intimately as relates to that religion. I had the good fortune of being on one of her religious uh, sojourns, if you will, to Bahia uh, about 10 years ago. And it was uh, a beautiful uh, country, Africa, that's us. And, mm -hmm. and then learning, and she's fluent in Portuguese because so she moves from um, uh, her Southern accent to start speaking in Portuguese is because she's fluent in Portuguese as well. And Dr. Harding is just a beautiful, beautiful person, wants to make sure that we learn and we share in our learning and in our growth. And I think I've done uh, justice to introducing you. I hope that I have. And I'm just wanting everyone to see you, to see your face, to see your essence. And so that when, when, you, when you open and begin sharing that folks will know uh, from where you come, two beautiful parents in terms of the training that you received, in terms of being a freedom um, activist, a social activist, and taking it from the academic perspective. You had to take it from, we have to be in all sectors of society. And so thank you and thank you all in this academic institution, making sure that that we all learn and grow. And so with that, I would just say, uh, thank you, Dr. Hunt, for making sure that this happened. And thank you, Dr. Harding, for making sure that it happened for real, for real, for being here. So thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much. I feel like I have really been welcomed and very well welcomed. Thank you to Dr. Aranga for that wonderful libation, just the powerful invocation of our ancestors and Dr. Valerie Hunt for just um, making this all possible and um, gathering us in and welcoming me and my dear sister, Professor Sonia Hunt Gray. Thank you for that wonderful welcome uh, introduction. And I'm just very happy to be with all of you tonight. Um, as I was saying at the outset before we started formally, my intention is just to share a few excerpts from the book that I wrote with my mother, uh, Remnants. It's uh, essentially a spiritual memoir, a spiritual autobiography, and it is primarily written in my mother's voice. It's her story and particularly the story of how she came from a Southern rural Georgia tradition of mystic spirituality and profound commitment to social justice and how that tradition went up to Chicago when the family migrated like so many of our people who left uh, the South for the North and the West and the Midwest, and then how she used those insights in the rest of her work, in the rest of her life as an activist, as a healer, uh, as a counselor. And um, so I, I 
I want to share a little bit of the book with you, and then I also want to have some time for us to talk. So I'm going to try not to talk too long. I'm going to read uh, from two sections. The first section um, that I'll read a couple of pieces from is the Precy. It's a foreword that uh, I wrote to the book in my own voice. So this that you're hearing now is me, Rachel, speaking about, about her mom. Um, it's a book that the book just a little bit of background for those of you who, who may not be familiar. The book took me about 10 years to write. I started writing it with my mother when she was living. And then she passed after uh, a long illness. Um, uh, diabetic neuropathic cachexia was the name of the, the illness. Uh, and when she passed, I, was, I then really just kind of dove in and focused on the work and finished it. So we started it together. And as she left the physical body, her spirit continued to come to me and make sure that I was doing this in the right way. So I feel like it reflects um, both my sensibilities and uh, very much my mother's life and her concerns um, and her desires that the, those who are here after her uh, understand some of the history of, of our people and some of the extraordinary potential that there is for all of us um, who come from all of the places of the world and are here in this country together. There is uh, extraordinary potential for us to make something very beautiful in this country. So I'll start with this forward. There is no scarcity. There is no shortage, no lack of love, of compassion, of joy in the world. There's enough. There is more than enough. Only fear and greed make us think otherwise. No one needs starve. There's enough land and enough food no one need die of thirst. There is enough water. No one need live without mercy. There is no end to grace. And we are all instruments of grace. The more we give it, the more we share it, the more we use it, the more God makes. There is no scarcity of love. There's plenty and always more. One, this is the universe my mother lived in, her words, her ways. This is the universe she was raised in by parents from rural Georgia who came up in the generation after slavery. People who had lived with many terrors, but who knew that terror was not God's final say. This is the universe she taught me. Whatever I call religion, is this inclusive Christian indigenous black Southern cosmology of compassion and connectedness. It is the poetry of my mother's life. Mama died at the end of winter in 2004. For almost 10 years, we had been writing, gathering up her stories, her long sweet flashes of brilliance, her prayers, what she remembered of her Woodlawn Chicago childhood and the high strong laughter of her mother and aunts, her father's gentle work worn hands. She was giving me what she knew I would need to survive this world and what I would need to love it. What she wanted me to tell about her, what she knew of God, the people we come from, and her many magnificent companions in the movement for justice in this nation. Lord, I have been writing Mama's story for too long, much too long, passing through so many sicknesses to get here. Hers, my father's, my brother's, my own. But she stood there like the mother in Lucille Clifton's poem at the other side of the river, holding out her heart and set to throw it across when my waiting hands could finally catch it. Two, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth 
and to keep alive for you many survivors. Genesis 45, seven. Mama trained her mind toward the good, even before she knew anything about Buddhism or the Dalai Lama, before she ever traveled to India. I don't know when it started. Maybe she was born that way, or perhaps she had seen her own mother and father do it so often, her aunts too, that it became an artless response. She would lean naturally into the side of encouragement and moral strength and forgiveness, though she was not imprudent. She could find a blessedness in anything. She assumed it was there and no matter how deeply hidden, her expert hand would scoop it out and show it to you. In her counseling, she used a Japanese practice of gratefulness, Nikon or Marita therapy. It emphasizes training our spirits toward gratitude, especially for our mothers and those others who sacrifice so much for our happiness and well being. That appealed to her. It works quickly, she told me. I told her she wouldn't have many clients if she kept asking people to remember what they had done to hurt their mothers and all the things their mothers had done to take care of them. That's the opposite of how most psychotherapists make their money, I said. She laughed. The Dalai Lama says, look upon all beings as if they were our mother. The person who has loved us best, loved us most in our life. The person who has been kindest to us. Treat all beings as if they were our mother because in fact, they are. Mama says, the Dalai Lama said, we have all been each other's mothers. In my classes, Mama tells the students, we have all been the good one. And we've all been the evil person. We have all been many things. And we yet carry those lifetimes in our cellular memory. Just as we carry all of the universe in our cellular memory. So there's no judgment of others, just the will to do good toward them, to show kindness in this life. We all want happiness. We all want someone to be kind to us. We all want and need and have the right to joy in this life, to avoid unnecessary suffering. None of us is more worthy than the next. None of us is less worthy than the next. We're all the same in this. We have all been each other's mothers. Three, listen to me. House of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel, a load on me from your birth, carried by me from the womb till you grow old, I am she. And when white hairs come, I will carry you still. I have made you and I will bear the burden. I will carry you and bring you to safety. Isaiah 46, three and four. This book is neither autobiography nor biography, but something of both and something else. It is mama's and it's mine. Mostly it's a representation of the richness of my mother's creative imagination, the mystic streams of her spiritual life and the lyricism and joy of her activism. It's also the way she modeled for me a female-centered indigenous wisdom about the world. There are women in communities all over this country and around the globe, I'm sure, like my mother. I have met some of them. Women with original and powerful ways of understanding life, ways that come from the struggles and pleasures of their lived experience, but that may not find much expression beyond their kitchen tables, their market stalls, or the crises in which their families inevitably turn to them for guidance. Like Mamie Till Mobley said, any trouble I ever had in my life, it took mama to get me out. My mother had a few outlets for her magnificence, 
but not nearly, it seems to me now, enough. Mama had an acute and gentle intelligence about navigating the world, finding the wine, the sweetness in unexpected places, the hard places, and sharing it, making it last, making more. We talk about loaves and fishes. Her understanding of social justice activism situated struggle very comfortably alongside hospitality and mothering. This is a meaning of activism I have not seen widely discussed among scholars, but the women of the Southern Freedom Movement and their families know about it. More than anything, it's an, act, it's an activism based in being family, bringing people into the house, literally and figuratively, making room and making welcome, letting people know there is room for them in the vision in the struggle, in the nation, in the family. Skipping forward now, eight. But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within this holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage, Ezra 9.8. When my mother died, we held two memorial services, one in Chicago at my cousin Philip's house, which was mostly family and a few old friends, and another one, a larger one, later that spring in Denver, where people from many strands of my mother's life came to honor her with stories and song and fellowship. At the first memorial, the one in Chicago, my father stood up and told everyone how mama had inspired and directed him to be the kind of teacher, writer, and pastoring presence that he became. He said, when Rose and I were first married, I sometimes spoke in a judgmental way. I had a tendency to lecture in hard, harsh tones, especially about racial justice issues, criticizing people for what they were not doing and doing wrong. My manner could be rough, even caustic at times. Rose observed me for a while, and then she took me aside and said to me, Vincent, you're a good speaker, but you can be very critical. People need encouragement. If you can give them that, it will inspire them to know they can change. Standing there, surrounded by my aunts and cousins and family friends from way back, I announced that I had known many intelligent people in my life, growing up around universities and in the movement. I had studied at plenty of fancy schools myself, but my mother was the smartest person I knew, categorically. She was brilliant. There wasn't a problem any of us ever had that she couldn't figure out how to help us through. I mean, her mind was sharp. Nothing got by her. Sometimes she perceived things so quickly and so keenly and so differently from anybody else that I had to whip my head around to catch the backdraft of her genius as it sped on its way to the next sun. Nine, remnant the remaining, the part left over, the trace still perfumed, ephemeral and persisting, the buried things coming up out the ground like ladders. Her dying was hard for us. We were weary and undone. I was not there at the very end. The ambulance beat me to the house and her heart had already stopped. But daddy and my aunt Sue were there and they held mama's hands and rocked her soft and sweet from this world to the next. The emergency workers revived the heartbeat, but nothing else. And then at the hospital, not even the heart would pulse on its own. Mama had gone. 
We sang for her in the hospital room, waiting the day or two until everybody could come to say goodbye. Hymns and spirituals, the old timey church songs she loved like the blues and the prayers from Ikeda and Bawa from Lama Zopa and the Odishas. We washed her with mint and marjoram and roses. We placed suras and Tibetan prayers on her chest, her forehead, whispered into her ears. And then after the wires and tubes and had all been released from her body and the room was quiet, we sat a while longer, then we left. Mama is gone, but she is not. Her hand still rests on my back when I am troubled or sick or frightened. She comes and she watches us, her nieces and nephews, her children, our father, her sisters, her beloveds, all the circle of those who remember her, we are her remnants. The remaining lace, the cloth, the small rocks. This book, not perhaps what she would have made of the vestiges, is still hers and mine and yours. So that's okay. the first thing. Thank you, thank you. That's the first thing I wanna share with you all. Um, would you like me to just go ahead and read the second and then we have a conversation or would anyone like to ask or make comments? What do you think would be best, uh, Dr. Valerie? I leave you in the hands of our friend, my sister and your friend. Sister Sonia? Mm -hmm. All right. Do you have a thought? Would you like me to continue? I, I, do, ha I do have a thought. What you shared was so powerful. I think that we should ask questions now. All right, I'm happy for that. I'm happy for that. And then go to the next part. You can't leave this part. Okay. Ms. Uh, Harris has her hand up. Okay. Hi, I just wanna say thank you so much. That was so, so moving. And, and as you were reading, I was really thinking about sustainability of relationships and, and whether those be familial or platonic and or in hope and optimism. And um, I guess the piece that I really pulled from what you just shared was more so a question of like really fostering a spiritual connection between self and others. And mm. for folks who would like to have a deeper connection or would like to explore that more intentionally, I know that we can talk about faith and we can talk about religion, but what you shared really seems something like internal, spiritual, other, otherworldly almost. Mm -hmm. And so from your perspective, um, how does one deepen that relationship? Oh, that's a wonderful question, um, Michaela. Thank you for asking. Um, I, I can think of a few things in response to your question, but what comes strongest is something that my mom used to say a lot. Um, she had a way of, um, I think both training herself and, and just in the way that she talked and guided us, uh, you know, her children and her nieces and nephews who live with her, my dad too. Um, she encouraged us to really build, um, just as you were saying, Michaela, a, a sense of connection to our internal spirit, our internal place of connection to God, to the universe, what the Yoruba people might call your ori, which is your internal head, your closest place of, of connection to, um, to the wisdom that guides you. And, and um, that manifests by learning how to trust your intuition and learning that, that um, there, there is something in you that we are all built in such a way that there is something in us 
that will guide us in the right direction if we listen to it, you know? Um, and so she would talk about um, following a leading. She would ask, you know, did you get a leading to do this? So I have a, there's a, I'm feeling a leading in this direction. Uh, and so the first thing that I would think of to, to respond to that is, and there are a variety of kinds of practices that can help us with this, but to, to find ways to deepen our trust of our own intuition, to know that our inner head, our inner spirit, our inner connection to the universe is so powerful that if we really trust it, if we really listen to it, it won't guide us wrong. Um, and I think among the ways to do that, as I said, certainly meditation, um, prayer, one of the things that has been extremely useful for me, um, uh, especially since my family moved out here to Colorado back in the 80s, um, where there's a lot of open space. I have a, there's a nice park and it's just a block or so from the house where I live uh, that has a little, a little creek running through it. Uh, and in the Candomblé tradition, I am guided by water, um, particularly by Oshun, who is the energy of um, sweet water of, uh, as opposed to salt water. So uh, creeks and rivers and streams and waterfalls. And um, so when, I, when I'm in a difficult situation, or sometimes when I just, you know, um, want to be someplace where I can get some clarity, I will go to water and I will try to just be still and listen. Um, so, but, but we all have, uh, and this is something that indigenous traditions all over the world uh, share in common in terms of an understanding that all human beings are connected to these natural forces in the universe, fire, water, earth, um, minerals, air. Uh, and it's a matter of listening to yourself, paying attention to yourself, knowing yourself well enough to see what are the, the elements of the universe that you um, vibrate most closely and fully with? Where do you feel comfortable or where do you feel a sense of strength and, and um, connectedness? Is it sitting by a, by a blazing fire? Is it being close to the ocean? Is it walking in a field, digging in the garden? I mean, your body and your spirit will help lead you to the places of connection that are natural and intrinsic for you in terms of connecting to, to universal forces and to um, um, that spirit that will, that will lead you. So that's the response that comes to me immediately. Um, we can think about it some more and maybe some, some other ideas will come or, or others of you in, who are on the Zoom may have some thoughts about it too, but that's what comes to me right away. Thank you, Dr. Harding. There's a question from, from Brother Amun. Okay. Brother Aman. Aman. I stand corrected. <laughs> brother Aman, if beloved brother Aman Graves. Yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I would love to introduce you to beloved sister Dr. Rachel Elizabeth Harding. You all of, of the same energy. I'll just leave it at that. All right. But I believe that beloved brother Amon Graves might have a question he'd like to offer. And I just want to make sure that that happened. Okay. Thank you. Well, I just, when you came from the south to the north, is that is that is that what I'm hearing? Um, I didn't hear the full question, just the last part you said when I came from the south to the north, but what was the first part of the question? Could you repeat your it? Your family, your family from the south when they made, when they went from the south to the north, they was able to hold on to a lot of their uh, culture yes. and continuity. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's very impressive. It's very good mm -hmm. so yeah. for a lot of us we wasn't able to make that type of continuity for a lot yeah. of black people. 
Yes, yes, I, I understand what you're saying and I agree. I have to say that in my case, um, well, two things happened. My, my family moved from the South in the 1920s and 30s. Well, act before the 30s, 1920s, because my mother was born in 1930 in Chicago and she was the first generation to be born up North. Um, I'm from Chicago. I'm sorry. I'm from Chicago. Oh, all right. All right. Yep. Yeah. She's from Southside, Chicago, 41st and Wentworth. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, but then when she married my dad, they moved back south to Atlanta to be a part of the Southern Freedom Movement. This was in 1961. And I, that's where I was born in Atlanta. So I think that's one thing. I think the fact that they moved back south. And, mm -hmm. and I spent my um, formative years, you know, my, the first 12 years of my life, I was in Atlanta uh, for most of that time. So that was, and, and then of course it was in the context of the freedom movement. So, you know, it, it was a period when the, the richness of African-American culture was, was, was um, kind of at a height in terms of its usefulness to, to the movement and to the to the nation. So that was one, one thing, Ashe. The second thing in my case that I think was really important was um, I spent a lot of time in Brazil. When I was in college, I did uh, like a semester abroad. And after that time, uh, decided that I wanted to, to connect more with um, Afro-Brazilian culture and religion and ended up making that my profession, making that my life. And what I saw, what I witnessed, what I felt in the Afro-Brazilian religious and cultural and political life helped me see things about Southern African-American culture that I don't think I would have seen if I didn't go to Brazil. I see. So, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, I, I saw the way that women in Candomblé, the Afro-Brazilian religion, for example, interacted women and men, but um, I was particularly watching the mm -hmm. women um, were engaging with spirit, the way that they connected, the way, the kind of attention that they paid to dreams and visions, the importance of food, the, the, the way that um, the, the holiness, sacredness comes and lives in your body. I mean, these are things that are all part of Southern African-American tradition, but I just wasn't as conscious of it as this high sacred ancestral inheritance until I went to Brazil. So. No shame. Yeah, I'm reading your book now, Purpose uh, for Thunder. Oh, wonderful! Wonderful! Yeah, I, okay. love it. You. I gave it to me. So I want to. Yeah, I'm um, reading that now. It's very interesting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to know that. I'm glad you're reading it, and thank you for the question. Thank you, so, so Dr. Much. Dr. Harding. Are you ready to read the? Yes. Let me just. I'll just do this one other section, and then we can close. Um, so uh, this this piece. I'll just let me preface it a little bit. There's a section in the book. Um, on the Pachamamas. It's called the Pachamama Circle. And I'm going to just tell you what this is, and then I'm going to read something from it. So when my mother was starting to get really sick, I was in uh, grad school and living at home. Uh, and I knew she wasn't, you know, up completely 100%, but I didn't realize how sick she was. And, um, and I, one day she and I were in a in a store, in a I think it was like a like a, a natural food store. Whole it wasn't Whole Foods because it didn't have Whole Foods then, but kind of like a a natural food store. And we were um, in a in the aisle, and my mother asked me something, and I spoke to her in this sharp way, you know. And as soon as I said it, I don't remember exactly what it was, but as soon as I said it, I looked at my mother and it looked almost, she, she looked pain. She looked almost like I had hit her. And I felt like, wow, you know, of course I felt horrible. Um, and that night I had this dream. And in the dream, 
there were these, I think there were five of these tall women and they were different races and different skin tones. They all had on these long kind of uh, long clothes. And um, my mother was standing behind them. And you know how in a dream, even if you don't hear the voice speaking, you, you, you are given to understand, you know, what somebody is saying to you. And what I was given to understand, <laughs> these women were saying, you know, you don't know who this is. And we are not going to let you hurt her. You, you have to treat this person with extraordinary care. And um, so that's what they were saying to me. And then the other thing I got to know about them, just, you know, at, they gave me to know this in the dream. Even though they were all, they represented, you know, different races. There was, a, there was one who clearly looked like she was from the continent of Africa. There was one who clearly looked like she was from uh, North or South America, an indigenous woman. There was one who looked like she was Asian. There was one who looked like she was from indigenous Europe, um, maybe one from uh, the Pacific Islands. Um, what they gave me to know is that they take care of all of each other's children. They are our collective mothers in the universe. And that's the name that the Quechua language, the indigenous people of um, Bolivia uh, and of Peru, the Andes call this energy of this mothering energy of the world is Pachamama, Mother Earth. And so I saw them, I saw the Pachamamas and they were showing me that they are all of our mothers and we are all of their children. And this person in particular, my mama, um, I needed to be very careful with. So that was the dream. And I told my mama the dream and she just loved it. And I mean, not even, so, I mean, I actually, I didn't even tell her the dream right away because it, you know, it got me and uh, it made me kind of get on the right track. But eventually when we were working on this book, I was, I told her about the dream and what she loved about it was this idea of, of women of all races and all colors um, being this guiding force of mothering, of life, of, of justice, of care in the universe for everybody. And then she started to do all kinds of things with it. So in the book, there are these stories, there are these ideas for dances. There's just a lot of things that come out of this idea of the Pachamamas. So the piece that I'm gonna read for you is called Pachamama Circle Two. <clears throat> and the subtitle is Sue Bailey Thurman and the Harriets. Uh, Sue Bailey Thurman was the wife, the second wife of a great uh, African-American mystic, Howard Thurman. And I'll mention a little, I'll say a little bit about them uh, in this piece. But she and my mom were very, very close friends, just as Howard Thurman was like a father to my dad. Uh, and then Harriet, of course, is Harriet Tubman, the great uh, leader of the Underground Railroad, uh, the warrior who freed so many of our people. Okay, Pachamama Circle, Sue Bailey Thurman and the Harriets. It starts with an epigraph. The quiet ways we developed to protect ourselves, each other in slavery, the glance, the scent word, the straying, safety construed of open lacework silence, a circle of energy, a circle of protection in the world. Now, of course, this is all in my mother's voice. In her later years, I would visit Mrs. Sue Bailey Thurman at the townhouse in San Francisco where she and her husband had lived together. We were old friends. And after Howard Thurman passed on, Vincent and I felt a special concern for Mrs. Thurman. We saw her often as possible, we saw her as often as we could. We always loved those visits with that gentle, brilliant, elegant woman. She had traveled the world and was knowledgeable about many things. She was a writer, a civic organizer, a profound thinker, and like her husband, she had a deep abiding interest in mysticism, justice, and peace. 
Once, as I was arriving, walking up the hill to her house, I had the sense of something unsafe. You know how you can get a feeling of something not quite right? I felt that. I was near in the house, so I kept walking toward it, but with my awareness keen to the circumstances around me. By the time I reached my destination, Mrs. Thurman was downstairs waiting for me. Now, normally she didn't meet me downstairs. Normally she'd wait for me to ring the bell and then she would buzz me in and I'd climb the stairs to the main entrance to the house. But this time she was downstairs in the foyer and she was opening the door for me. And I could feel that she had been sending protection out to me just like I had felt my mother, Mama Freeney, do once years ago as I came up to the house at 41st and Wentworth. I didn't know exactly what it was I was perceiving as I approached Mrs. Thurman's place, just something not right, a possible danger to me. Anyway, I felt it and then I felt protected. When we got upstairs to her living room, we were silent. She and I sat and the two of us went quiet inside ourselves. That's what we would do when we needed to sense the presence of, of this circle, this circle I'm telling you about. Howard Thurman has a story about this kind of care and danger. I heard him tell it a few times and a version is printed in his book, The Luminous Darkness. In the story, Thurman is traveling by railroad and arrives in a small Southern town late at night where he is met by a black man he doesn't know with a message to be cautious. Thurman has disembarked to wait for a connecting train and the man approaches him unannounced and begins walking alongside him, explaining that there's tension in the area because the sheriff was killed that afternoon and it isn't safe for a black man to go into town. He advises Thurman to sit in the segregated waiting room with his suitcase in full view in front of him so that any white man approaching will see that he's a stranger waiting for a connecting coach and he'll be less likely to be harmed. The man doesn't talk long. He has met every train that has arrived during the night and given the warning to black passengers as they got off. Thurman told this story from his own experience, but he also told it as an example of what was typical among Black people in that time. It was ind indicative of the way if there was danger, somebody would be sent to warn you, to protect you. Living in this country in the 1920s and 30s, especially in the South, required a certain sensitivity and attunement to jeopardy and an understanding of one's connectedness as a black person to others who shared your vulnerability. That awareness was put at the service of individuals and families, as well as the larger community. The concern was not solely for racist violence, although there was that. It was also generally for protection of people who might be in danger. It was something that pe black people had to be constantly aware of. And so I think we develop a certain discernment about it. I think women had a heightened sense of this and they would send people to look out for those who might be at risk. This was the kind of perceptiveness Mrs. Thurman carried. My mother had it too. I remember Mama Freni used to just send us places, go there, you know, go see about Miss so-and-so, go here. And we didn't ask why, we just went. She would tell us to go check on neighbors or younger nieces and nephews. My niece Jean remembers how Mama Franny dreamed ways to help people and situations, to know when and what to do. My mother would talk about who she had seen in a dream, people dead and gone, and what they told her should be done. Here's a story I've been thinking of that I wanna tell about this. It's a group of women they are women, but they're also spirits. They live all over the world, among all the world's people, and they are connected to each other. But their connection is secret. The women are all African because we are all African. 
they are the daughters of the first mother. The women carry a knowledge and tradition of protection, a wisdom of transformation. It's not a spoken knowledge. It is not something anyone talks about. It is in the body, glimpsed from an angle when they are slicing onions or braiding hair or setting the limbs of a poem. Mostly you can see it when they dance or when they are sitting utterly still. It is a gene, an element of their cells that rests in the mitochondria. It vitalizes their bloodline. These women are vessels and founts. They are a source. The ones who remember what it is to be human in the world. They preserve this wisdom in the art of their lives, cultivating it in stories, in the way they move, in the paintings and pots they sculpt, in the fearlessness of their fighting. They carry this knowledge in their bodies as they go about their tasks and the encounters of their days and they pass it on quietly. Their children, all of their children have a bit of the inheritance. It's like a seed, but it won't bloom until they too are older. And it is the female line that passes the wisdom on. These women are of every race and every shade of skin and texture and color of hair. Their bodies are of every size, but their spirits are tall. They are physical and they are ethereal. These are the Pachamamas, the protective spirits of the earth, so named by the people of the Andes Mountains in the Quechua language. They are the most ancient spirit mothers, sisters to Nana Buruku and Amaterasu. They are all connected wherever they are. They recognize each other. You know, my mother told me there were many Harriets, Harriet Tubman's. She told me whispering as if it was something still to be shrouded, still to be protected, this fact, this sisterhood, so that they could rise up again and help us when we need them. My great grandmother, Grandma Rye said she had met Harriet. And she knew of other women too, who stole into the swamps, into the night perils with one, two, three, seven people behind them following their leading out of slavery. In my story, these women are all Pachamamas. They're part of that circle of protection, that circle of grace that has been here since the beginning of the world, since the beginning of people. They have promised to take care of each other's children all over the world. So you cannot tell who will love you by race, who will shelter you just by nation. They are all our mothers and we are all their children. In slavery time, some of these women look white. The caramel tan of their faces, muscled forearms and exposed feet contrasted with the stark cream color of their legs, of their backs, when the masters lifted their clothes to beat them. These women, all colors, helped each other. The ones who worked in the big house, sending messages to others in the field, tell Minty to go tonight. They're gonna sell her and her children tomorrow. The ones who worked in the cane, in the cotton, in the smokehouse, dredging out the canals from muck, chopping wood and making bricks alongside the men, found a meeting ground in a hush harbor someplace, steady patting feet and the backs of their babies, moaning in a presence that shored up their hearts for more struggle, more strength. And these women in slavery time who had been through so much, whipped until they bled, their hands scarred, their faces and breasts scarred because these were the most beautiful parts of their bodies. These women found their way into the Pachamama circle. 
In slavery time, the Pachamamas were Harriets, and later they were our Idas and Bessies, and they became Sue Bailey Thurman and Elizabeth Catlett Mora and Catherine Dunham and Nina and Billy and Shirley Graham Du Bois and Ella Baker and Septa McClark and my mama and grandmama and great grandmama. They are Cleo Parker Robinson now and Ann Braden and Dolores Huerta and Rachel Noel and Marion King Jackson. We have so many women who stand mid current in the river, giving fresh water to the tribes, showing us how to be well again. They are the warrior reconcilers, the healer sorcerers. They are the scientists, conjurers, the guides, and they are mothering. They are mothering, Rachel, drawing their circles of protection and power around us, even as we look elsewhere, teaching about how to be family, how to live like family, how to live with some strength and care in your hands, how to live with some joy in your mouth, how to put your hands gentle where the wound is and draw out the grief, how to urge some kind of mercy into the shock-stained earth so that good will grow. These Pachamamas, let me tell you something about them. Let me tell you something about the way they mother. They stand sometimes a little bit on that side of uncertainty, just across the edge of where you don't always know what they might do, what they are capable of. I think about Iman Ja, the Odisha of salt waters, the sea mother. She is quintessential abundance and maternal energy, affectionate, generous with her love and her resources, feeding the world from the affluent waters of her womb. But the ocean is a mighty woman, Rachel. And Iamaja, when necessary, or as the moment strikes her, can discipline with a swiftness, insistent and devastating, even wrathful, imposing her strictures with fierceness and force, belying the steady, regular rhythm of her day-to-day -day waves. So there is this about the Pachamamas too the great surge, the mountain, the whirlwind that rises quickly from the solar plexus and rushes wherever it must go, lifting grounded things high into air. And this is the circle I'm telling you about. All this is the circle. There are a lot of things, Rachel, that the family doesn't talk about mystic things that occupied Grandma Rye in her herbs, her medicines, her silences. If you listen to the older cousins, to my sisters, without asking them directly, you'll hear. Some of the things that Pamp says about how people were afraid of my mother, Mama Freeney, well, that's where Mama Freeney got it from, from Grandma Rye. Also, the very quick way that Alma always says our great grandmother was Christian, as if to head off any possibilities to the contrary. Some of these things are secret. And some of them will never be spoken. Not from rule or restriction, but because they don't live in the language. They live in the body. They live in the gesture and the way the rays of the sun radiate off the Pachamama's backs, from their shoulders, their heads, their hands. Some of this is not something you talk about. It is in the body, like the Holy Ghost. It is in bone, in blood, in the soft space under the tongue resting. Ashe. Ashe, 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 Ashe. Some of us would say amen. Ashe and amen. <laughs> and we thank you. <laughs>
Thank you too. Thank you too. So much, oh. Dr. Rachel. Mm -hmm. May I? Yes, beloved uh, sister, Dr. Rachel Elizabeth, beloved elder sister, Sharon Spence Wilcox will uh, give us the honor of offering a sending to you. Oh, wonderful. She is a woman who from the very beginning, uh, let me know that she is a mother's 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 daughter's daughter's daughter. All right, all right. Thank you. I, I, I am so full. My mm -hmm. heart is so full. I am so grateful for you, mm -hmm. for you, Dr. Rachel, sharing the remnants of your memories of you and your mother. Thank you so much for that. And um, as I read last night and as I listened this afternoon, things that stood out for me are that we are all African. Yes. That our mama's spirit live in all of us. Yes. Mm. Mm. That sometimes our mamas may not be our blood mamas. Right. right. And that's okay. Yes. And that just takes me to the 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 statements about the pachamamas hmm. how we're all everybody's mama right it's a circle we're we all have that mothering inside of us so thank you thank you thank you for bringing that to light for us for bringing the water to us hmm. the sweet water Mm. And the salt water, mm -hmm. the water we live in before we come out of the womb yes. and the water that surrounds us, yes. the earth that surrounds us, the fire, the air, all of it for reminding us to stay close to that, yes. to yes. find that piece of life right. of the universe that is going to sustain us, That's right. to bring us joy, That's to right. strengthen us. So thank you for that. Oh, wonderful. And one of the things I say when I say thank you and I say walk good, hmm. because in Jamaica where I was born and grow, that's what we say to oh. our friends. Be well, farewell, and until we meet again, walk good. Hmm. Mm. Thank you so much. I love that. Walk good. I knew you were going to like that gift, Dr. That. Rachel Elizabeth. <laughs> I knew you yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to tell a secret, though, beloved Rachel Elizabeth. Dance good, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. We I want to give praise, honor, and thanks to your mother, your mother's mother, and your mother's mother's mother by putting in the chat any names of mother's mother's mothers that we want to share today. Let's offer that to uh, Rosemary Freeney Harding who's in the room with us. Let's make that offering so when, as she has an ancestor, you can go seek out our ancestors. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that Rosemary Freeney will look for Cersei Lee Terrible. And while you're doing that, I'm just gonna put the pictures of my mother and my grandmother so that you can see. Wonderful. I had Rosemary. asked some folks if they had pictures of their parents, if yes. they could bring them with them today To Some folks might have robbed them. Can we see him again? Oh, wonderful, wonderful, beautiful. Thank you. So Rosemary is going to be looking for Cersei Lee Turbeville, yes, Jackie Harris, Yvonne, Yvonne Mitchell, and and I won't I don't want to mispronounce for Miss Harris, uh, one of your mother's mother's mothers. Good. Hmm. We are hoping that you will grace us with another offering sometime in the uh, in the spring. I know that you will be coming to uh, Evergreen State College, which was founded by our matriarch, Dr. Maxine Mims, who right. we let her know that you were going to be here, as I had said to you earlier. One, two of her very close uh, counselors and companions as uh, Elder Dr. Marsha Tateranga and cultural custodian Amon Graves. So they okay. carried uh, you, the word of your being here too, Dr. Mims. Oh, and wonderful. Dr. Mims founded Evergreen State College at a kitchen table. Wow. wow. 
Wow. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, um, Dr. Well, Runga might want to say something. If, if you don't mind, I would like to read the names of the mothers and mothers' mothers that people have put in the chat. You um, are Sonia Solak. Yes. <laughs> Circe Lee Turbeville, Jackie Harris, Yvonne Mitchell, Ether Goza, Sonia Lynn Hunt Gray, Muang Vang Sai Li, the grandma rapper Joy Lynn, Gloria Marjorie Spence, Lorelei Jean Culp Wilkie, Gretel Maud Spence, Murdy Hunt, Kaziah Myrie, Nina Fadsey, Andrianette Merricks, Francine Robinson, Cheryl Hunt Kearney, Eunice Louise St. Laurent, Catherine Mary Halbert, Geneva Godot Tate, Juanita K. Hunt, Circe Turberville, Victoria Jackson Gray Adams, Annie Yates McCoy, Valerie Hunt, Louise Hunter Anderson, and Murdy Hunt, Terry Embry, Cheryl Hunt, Candace Webb, Mothers to the World. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Mm. And with that, we would like for our elder, uh, Marshall Tater Runga to, uh, and Rachel, <laughs> Rachel Elizabeth, Rachel Elizabeth Harding. Uh, and with this, uh, we want to breathe in and out in a way that our elder in the room, Dr. Marsha Tatarunga, uh, will, uh, if, if you be so kind. Absolutely. Can we all just, you know, there is one breath in this universe. Hmm. And we're all going to tap into it by inhaling slowly and exhaling slowly. Again, inhale. And exhale. Dr. Harding, I just want to send you with all the blessings you brought to us mm -hmm. to send you back with them. Thank you for blessing us with your words, for reminding us of the sacred role of motherhood for reminding us of our connection to the water, the earth, the wind, all of the elements that were given to us that, that are there to heal us and to lift us higher in vibration. You have been our mother today. Thank you so much for what you have brought to us. And in the name of my mother, Geneva Godot Tate, and my, my friend's mother here, say her name. Annie Yates McCoy. Annie Yates McCoy. Mm -hmm. We, from our mothers to your yes. mother. Yes, yes. We just want to say thank you. Yes. Let them live forever through yes. us. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Ashe. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Hunt, for this, the foresight, mm -hmm. the way that you knew this would be a healing program. Thank you for the invitation and for the the to, for making sure that Dr. Uh, that Dr. Um, Harding could be with us today. How blessed we all are! And you just continue to pour your wisdom and your your just greatness hmm. of presence to, on us. We hmm. are all so blessed. Yes. And to all my beautiful <laughs> colleagues at Seattle Central to the sister of Valerie, to the mother of Valerie. My greetings and thank you for everyone. Let us remember this moment as a precious, mm -hmm. sacred time. Oh, Ashe. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everything I do because is to in honor of my mother, everything. Mm -hmm.
So with this in mind, we're going to have a Bernice to sing us out. And uh, those who could stay, um, although our program was to uh, end at five o'clock, we come and go in freedom in this world. <laughs> we come and go in freedom. All right. All right. Well, actually, we'll do Phenomenal Woman. <laughs> All right, good people. And those who are able to stay, please do. And those who have to come and go in freedom. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. Cute, built to suit fashion model size. When I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. Oh, it's in reach of my arms, span of my hips, the stride in my steps, the curl of To a to a man who fell his and they fall down on their knees. Then they swam around me like a hound on every knee. Oh, I see it's in the fire in my eyes, flash up my teeth. Swing up my waist, the joy in my feet. Thank you all, phenomenal women.